All right, you can take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter 12. Start in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord, excuse me, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now jump to verse 9. And Abram journeyed, going on still towards the south. And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt, sojourned there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. And Father, I, I pray you take this and your words and you use them for your honor and glory. And Father, uh, use me to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for what you do for us. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. In this passage that we read, this is the first mention of the word famine in the Word of God. First mention. And we know famines are always grievous. That's what it said here, that it was a grievous famine. famine. And we, know, we understand that, that God uses issues and trials and situations in our, in our lives to get us directed in another path. And this was one of the options or one of the, the ways that God told Abraham, hey, listen, you need to go down here. So he went to Egypt. Another one was, in, with, was with Isaac, where he was told because of a famine to go to Gear in Genesis chapter 26. Famines are never good things. Matter of fact, there's over 90 verses in Scripture that use the word famine or famines. Now, we understand if God says something once, he meant it, but if he says it over 90 times, that he's trying to get a point across. Let me give you four of the worst famines of the 20th century. 1927, northwest China, 6 million people died. 1932 to 1934, in the Ukraine, 7 to 8 million people died. 1921 to 1922, the Soviet Union, 9 million people died. 1958 to 1962, it is estimated that between 10 and 30 million people died of a famine. So this was a grievous famine. Their lives had been uprooted. They had been been torn. They were told to go somewhere else. The Bible talks about three different types of famine. Of course, this is a physical famine. A physical famine, a shortage of food or water. Then there's a Prophetic famine. As in Genesis chapter 41. Turn with me there. Genesis 41. We're going to be doing a lot of flipping. Not literally. I hope not anyway. We see starting in verse 15. I'm not going to read the whole passage. But I'm going to give you a a little heads up on what's happening. Remember Pharaoh had a dream. Actually, he had two dreams, and he couldn't understand the interpretation of them, so he called in Joseph. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of a river, and behold... There came up out of the the river seven kind, fat-fleshed and well-favored. And they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean-fleshed. So as I have never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness, and the lean and and ill-favored kind did eat up the, the first seven fat kind, and then he goes on, he says, listen, I woke up because I was afraid and I turned around and I went back to sleep and I had another dream where the stalks of corn grew up and they had seven ears on each, each stalk and they were fat and they were just luscious. And then uh, seven bad ears of corn came up and it did eat up the good corn. And Joseph ended up telling him, listen, it's not two dreams, it's just one. And God is trying to tell you there's going to be seven years of plenteous in seven years of grievous famine. If you look back at verse number uh, 19, Pharaoh says, 
such at the end of it, such as I have never saw in the land of Egypt for badness. Never seen anything like that before. No food, no water. God was giving him a prophetic circumstance that was going to take place. We see that also. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 and verse 1. We see the same kind of situation, but Jesus is talking to his disciples. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 24, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when, these, when shall these things be? And what shall these signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes, and diver places. The disciples were asking, tell us when we can see these things. He said, listen, when these things take place, you can tell that the end of time is coming. Jesus once again is telling them of the future. He's giving them a prophetic prophetic message. It's coming. He tells us again in the book of Revelation that when he's opening up the seals that, hey, when you see these things happening, there's going to be a great famine in the land. Oh, those are bad, right? The physical famine, the prophetic famine, but doesn't come close to the last one. Now, I told you there's three famines mentioned in the Word of God. The last one's the spiritual famine. This is the most dangerous type of of any because it's a famine of God or from God. We understand that from the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew, 400 years passed where God did not speak to them. What if that happened today? We feel like a lot of times God has turned his back on America and on our our country, but he hasn't. In 2 Chronicles chapter 15, 1 through 3, it says, And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him... He will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. A long time. A long time they've been out without God. Look at Amos chapter number 8. Amos chapter 8. Guess I better find it myself. Look at verse 1 and 2 of Amos chapter 8. It says, Thus hath the Lord showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people, Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. Now look at verse 9. And it came to pass... In that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in a clear day, and I will turn your feast into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. I will make it as the morning of the only sun, and the end thereof as bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, 
but of hearing the words of the Lord. He said, listen, your lack of food and water is the the least of your problems. He's saying, I'm going to send a famine where there's no more hearing the word of God. What a terrible thing. No more hearing the words of the Lord. We sit in churches Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, and we walk out of the church's services and we don't have a clue what was just said. We don't have a clue. Let me give you four dangers of a spiritual famine. Number one, a famine consumes you. It consumes you. As we saw in Genesis chapter 41 with Joseph when Pharaoh called him in and asked him about that, he's he's telling him, listen, I'm consumed with it. I need to find out what this dream means. And of course, Joseph, through the power of God, explains the physical famine that's going to take place. But that can only destroy your body. The spiritual famine consumes the hearts and lives. A spiritual famine takes everything from us. When a spiritual famine comes upon us, we get upset about the smallest of issues. And those issues start to take control. They start to make us think in ways we would never think before. We get mad over nothing. When if we look in Scripture in Psalms 119, 165, it says, well, yeah, great peace have them which, have, which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Great peace have them which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. As I said earlier, we're so politically correct, we can't joke with anybody anymore. And it's a shame when Christians can't joke with Christians. When you walk out of here and you haven't talked to people in years because they had said something to you years ago and you can't get over it. You're in a spiritual famine. Because God says nothing shall offend you. Nothing. Man, as much as I'm picked on here. (laughs) Really? You know, I've just learned over the years... And maybe it was my, my, my mom. Just don't take people so serious. Take everything with a grain of salt. But we don't, do we? Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Start in verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And he had a sister and she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now one thing I learned in college is that when you're reading, most people don't have an imagination anymore because it's watching the TV all day long. When I was growing up, my grandfather, I might have told you this before, he had an old record player and he had some of the old radio programs on albums from the 50s. And one of them, my sister and I, my brother wasn't born yet, my sister and I would sit there and listen to them. One of them was called The Shadow. Anybody remember The Shadow radio program? And it started off every program. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> and we were like, ooh. We could just a, pa- a picture and imagine all these things that are going on in this, this radio program, man, how it just came alive to us. That's the way the Word of God should be. When you read it, we understand that Paul, when he preaches, when he, when he speaks, he's very animated with his hands. Scripture talks about it. He's very animated. He talks like this all the time. 
this passage. I want to picture in your mind the scene, Jesus in Martha's house. All of the disciples sitting around, Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's in the kitchen. She knows I'm in here alone. I got all this. I got to cut the potatoes for fried potatoes and pinto beans and cornbread. And could not. She's in there sitting at the feet of Jesus. Well, you've never been there, have you? Sure. We've all been there. And this is, she's thinking on this. She's dwelling on it. And she's getting upset now. Because a little thing that doesn't really matter has now become a big issue. So what does she do? Kicks the door open. Jesus! Lord! I'm in here killing myself! She's sitting here! You know what she did when she did that? She took all of the focus and eyes off Jesus and put them on her. She became the main focal point, not Jesus. When we get into a spiritual famine, it's about us. It's not about Jesus anymore. It's about us and what we can get. Oh, I mean, I've been there. How it just dwells and simmers and, and it's like a canker sore. It just gets ready to explode. And Imagine, they're listening to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, boom, everything changed. What? And they started watching Martha. And listening to her instead of listening to things that they should have been listening to. Matthew 4, 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See, Mary had it right. She was getting the food that would keep her going, not a meal that she would have to eat again the next day. Oh, Martha was busy, don't get me wrong. She was busy serving. And if you've ever been in the ministry, you can get so busy serving that you become and fall into a spiritual famine. It can happen to anybody at any time. I mean, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, Jesus loved them. I mean, he raised their brother from the dead. But she had slipped into a spiritual famine. And she didn't realize it. And Jesus looked at her. Oh, this would be the part that just get me. Your daddy ever said this to you? Boy, boy. Mm, mm, mm. Jesus looked at her. Martha, Martha. Mm. You think she just kind of ducked her head, went on back to the kitchen, being, being rebuked by our Lord and Savior? Martha, mm, Martha. See, Mary had it right. She understood it all. So a spiritual famine, when we get in it, it consumes us. It consumes us. Secondly, a spiritual famine takes you where you don't want to go. Takes you where you don't want to go. We look in the, the book of Ruth where Elielech takes his family down to Moab. At this time, Moab and Israel had a great relationship, so it was a good trip. But most of the time, Moab was the enemy of Israel. So there's a great famine in the land. So Elielech thinks, hey, I'm going to take my wife um, uh, Naomi and my kids, and we're going to go into Moab because there's food there. Now, we have the whole Bible. We have the, the, the end results of it all. He didn't have it. We understand now that this was God's plan in order to usher Ruth into the lineage of Jesus Christ. He didn't know it. He was just going to try to protect his family. And unfortunately, it ended up costing his life and his son's two lives. Sometimes it, spiritual famines take you where you don't want to go where you don't need to be. You start running with people that you ain't got no business running with. You start hanging out in places you got no business hanging out with or hanging out in. Spiritual famines are not good. It's devastating. 
We saw Timothy, uh, we see Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He had been with Paul and heard all of the stories and, and seen the miracles that Paul did through, through Jesus Christ. And man, that spiritual famine got him. Having loved this present world, he turned and went to Thessalonica. See, the world just slips in there and grabs you at any time when you're not expecting it. And that spiritual famine can suck you in, Christian teenager. Christian adult, Christian single. And once you're there, it's hard to get out of that spiritual famine. So we see it consumes you, takes you where you don't want to go, and a spiritual famine makes you do things you normally wouldn't do. Look at me at look with me at Second Kings. Second Kings chapter six. Verses 26 through 29. Now let me set, th- set you up with this. There's a great famine in the land. Once again, we're talking about spiritual famines. Okay? So each one of these stories is going to be about a famine, a great famine that takes place. In verse 26, And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the winepress? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman saith unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hit him. Now surely there's no one in here that would physically eat their child. But the famine had become so so grievous in the land that they had gotten into the spiritual famine. Oh, surely nobody would do that. But we don't think anything about eating another Christian, do we? With gossip. You know, let me tell you something about gossip. The gossip very seldom gets the story right. And it only hurts the people that don't deserve to be hurt. Well, what a famine that made this lady eat her own child. We don't think anything about Sunday afternoons going out to lunch and having pastor for food. Hmm. Or talking about other Christians and ruining our our testimony for Christ. We don't think anything about that. There's no difference, I'm sorry. We should love our brethren and our sisters like their family because why? They are. But if you constantly gossip, you constantly want to find out what the latest... I'm sorry, you're in a spiritual famine. God calls that an abomination. Hey, let me just say, it's none of your business. If you want to find out something, go to that person. I mean, we hear from this pulpit, this is nothing you haven't heard before. It's just coming out with a different voice and dark hair. A spiritual famine makes you do things you normally wouldn't do. This woman wouldn't have never never even imagined to eat her own son. But it's it's become so easy for us to talk about other Christians instead of edifying and bringing them up. We want to make ourselves look better. Well, I would never do that. You don't have a clue what you would do. You don't have a clue what you would do. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 13 says this, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one for another. For love as, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereto called, 
that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and, and ensure it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of those that do good? Wow. He's telling us, man, we shouldn't run down other Christians. We shouldn't have them for lunch. So what he's saying. Man, your brothers and sisters in Christ should be something special to you. You know, I, I count it a blessing to be able, and I know the rest of the staff does too, to be able to go out and just sit and talk to Mrs. Edna. I told her the other day, it was just her and I and, and Brother Ron, and he was in and out, and she was telling me, you know, you can just heartache stuff. And I think she did that with Brother Jeff and Brother Brown. She's just really hurting. And I told her, I said, listen, Miss Edna, I really need a hug. I really need a hug. And she got up, she came over, and she just busted. She lost it. I didn't need the hug. She did. See, that's what we should do to other brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to comfort them and, and love them and show them the, the, the good nature of Jesus Christ in our lives instead of always trying to run people down and make them sound worse than us. And if you do that, I'm sorry, you're in a spiritual famine. So a spiritual famine consumes you. It takes you where you don't want to go. It makes you do things that you normally wouldn't do. And a spiritual famine makes you stop doing what you normally would do. You start, stop reading your Bible. You lose interest. It becomes just another book. It, it's not real anymore. Let me tell you, this is alive. This book comes alive. And if it's dead to you, it's because you're in a spiritual famine. Every time I'm sitting here, and I'm sure I'll do it with Brother Abbott, one of my favorite speakers is uh, Brother Tom Wallace. I wish I had his voice. You know, if you know who I'm talking about, it just resonates, man. I mean, but he, last time he was here, he was speaking out of the book of, of Psalms. And I'm thinking, man, I have read that over and over. Where did he get that? From God. Why? Because the word of God is in his life. It's alive. You know, so many times we're out on visitation, we, we hear that, well, I just don't understand the King James Bible. Hmm. Really? Why? The author lives within you. Why don't you understand it? Maybe it's because you only pick it up on Sundays. Maybe it's because you don't even pick it up on Sundays. And when you have trouble, as it says in the book of Proverbs, God says, I will laugh at your calamities. So when you're going through problems, you take it off the bookshelf and <laughs> blow it off. Thinking God's going to hear you. You're in a spiritual famine if you start reading your Bible. You're in a sp spiritual famine if you start praying. God doesn't listen. You become too busy. It's... Prayer is just a waste of time. Wow. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. You want answered prayer? You have a family member going through a situation in their life? You better be right with God. You better have a prayer life. Because if you don't, you've missed the boat. And I would hate to think that my relationship with Jesus Christ and my lack of prayer time hindered my family member from either getting saved or living after a tragic accident. It'd be terrible to get to heaven and find out, oh yeah, you prayed. I didn't hear you. Wow. I wonder how many Christians all over the world are going to be standing there one day and hear that. Stop praying. Stop reading your Bible. You stop loving other Christians. You don't forgive. You don't fellowship anymore. That's one thing I love about our church. 
when I lock up, people are still standing in here. You lock the doors, I'll open the door and say, turn the lights out when you leave. People love to fellowship here. Oh, I'm sorry, there's, there's times that you have to go. Seriously, I mean, there might be a, a, something you have to take care of, so after the church service, you can't stay around. But if it's every, every Sunday and every Wednesday, as soon as the church service is over, you're headed out the door, you're in a spiritual famine. Because the fellowship is what helps us become a great church. I've been in a church, my wife and I, we were on vacation. We go to, we go to church when we're on vacation. Anybody else? Yes, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we go. You know, and I told the young people in our morning devotions just last week, I would hate to think that I went on vacation and didn't go to church. I couldn't imagine it, not going to church, because you see some crazy churches, and I like crazy. And they don't do it the same way we do it, and that's okay. But I told the young people, I said, listen, I'm standing in front of God and I'm talking to God. Lord, I'm not going to be able to be in church Wednesday. We're going on vacation. You'll understand, won't you? Yeah. Yeah. Vacation. This is God talking back to me now. Vacation. Hmm. I've never had a vacation. That's a pretty good idea. Vacation. Where could I go? Mountains. No, created that. Ocean. No, no, what's there? Huh. Well, I'll figure it out. I'm going to take a vacation too. That's a great idea. I appreciate you bringing it up. But while I'm gone, you're going to have to tell your heart to beat. You're going to have to tell your lungs to, to breathe. You know, I'm on vacation. I'm relaxing. I'm not going to take care of anybody, Okay. I'm taking my hands of protection off you and your family. Man, I'd hate to hear God say that. That's why I'm going to be in church. But we were on vacation. And it was a family from up in Missouri, a missionary. They were there in the church too, and the church service was over, seriously, maybe five minutes. Ten at the most, everybody was gone but us. His family and my family. His wife was talking to my wife. I was talking to him. We got to looking around. They turned off the lights in the auditorium. The doors were locked. I was like, where did everybody go? He said, I don't know, man. It's the strangest thing I ever saw in my life. I said, is there anything you need for your church? You need a sound system? Hey, we'll load it up in your car. <laughs> they don't know. Ah. <sighs> You know, it's a church that's in a spiritual famine. When you don't enjoy the brethren enough just to stick around for a few minutes. I'm not saying you have to spend the night here. Well, if you do, turn the lights off when you leave. (laughs) But you lose and stop loving the brethren. The really thing that foretells what kind of spiritual famine you're in, you stop going to church. Or you're hit and miss. You start thinking no one's going to miss you. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Pastor asked me almost every Monday, hey, where was so-and-so? Yeah, I didn't see him. Hmm. He knows where you're sitting. I told the, the church this morning, this is what we ought to do. I love this. If you say that I said it, I'm going to say, they're lying. No, I wouldn't do that. He's going to come back from South Korea Saturday. He's going to still be Sunday. He's going to be jet lagged. Let's move. This section to here, this section to here, this section to here, that section over there. He will go dizzy. Because you know how when just one family moves, it really throws him off. Nobody's going to miss me. I promise you, Pastor Allison misses you. He knows when you're here and when you're not here. As he said many times, he walks around the auditorium and prays for where you're sitting and for you. You're in a spiritual famine, not 
if you stop going to church, church doesn't, it's not important anymore. Man, I've got other things that are more important. Fishing, just sitting on the couch. I don't watch NFL anymore. If you do, that's your business. The commissioner for the NFL can come out tomorrow and say, listen, we've decided we're going to all stand up and, and salute the flag. I'm done with them. I'm done. I don't care what you do. I won't watch you. I won't go to anything. I won't buy any of your, your um, uh, jerseys or whatever you have. It's, I'm done. Now, if you still watch, that's your business. But when you disrespect the flag and men and women who have died for this country, i got no use for you. Especially if you're a 22-year-old kid that's making millions of dollars and you're saying that life's just not fair. Walk in my shoes. When you grow up in a home where the, the plaster is cracked on the ceiling and your dad is in a body cast for a year because he was roofing his grandmother's house and fell off and broke his back. And your mother stands in the food chain line or the cheese line and gets food stamps. And you're going to sit there and complain and you're making $20 million a year? I got no use for you. Even though my life was like that growing up, I live in the greatest country on the face of the earth. Why do you think everybody wants to come here? You stop going to church. It's not important anymore. Oh, here's the one. You've all heard it. The preacher preaches the same thing all the time. Every message is salvation. Duh. Every Sunday morning he preaches the same thing. Thing over and over and over. Okay? How would it be if you brought your family this Sunday, the anniversary Sunday? They're lost. And you had a pastor that got up and didn't say anything about salvation, anything about Jesus Christ. I bring my family here so they will hear that. Because I know my pastor is going to preach that. I know it. How bad would it be if we, we had a pastor that just told stories? Don't work that way, does it? The Word of God what convicts people and changes lives. In 1990, November the 18th, when Brother Borf was preaching at a little country church in Greenbrier, Alabama, and I accepted Jesus Christ, the Word of God changed my life. And everybody sitting in here that has accepted Jesus has the same kind of story. Oh, it might be a little different here and there. And you might be brought up in a Christian home and and you were saved later on. Now, is that step of faith? I want to hear a pastor. I don't want to get in that spiritual famine that I said everybody can slide into at any time. Even a pastor. We can slide in that spiritual famine where we, you know, I sure, would, I sure don't want to go to church today. Man, it's such a beautiful, beautiful day out and the, the water on the lake is just slick as glass. Man, that boat will just fly down through there. And man, I'd hate to think that I called pastor, I'm sick, man. God, I can't make it today. Then I go out on the boat, boat sinks. They find me floating in the river. That'd be my luck. <laughs> Well, I was going to have to fire him anyway. I don't want to take a chance. Spiritual famines are bad things. We understand our country is in a spiritual famine now. Let me ask you a question. Are you? Are you? Martha, Martha. If that was you, would God say, your name? Mm, mm, mm. But how do you get out of the famine? 
Remember where you came from and who saved you. Boy, I look back at my life and I, seriously, I should either be dead or in jail. And by the grace of God, as I said, November the 18th, 1990, for some unknown un, reason, to me at that point, I had the urge to go to church. Church, really? Man, and I saw the goodness and love of Jesus Christ that morning. And he changed my life. Spiritual famine. Remember who you are and where you came from. Secondly, hey, remember where you're going. That should be enough to keep us reading the Bible, to keep us loving our brethren, to keep us doing these other things that we have to do to to stay out of a spiritual famine. And we're going to heaven. Man, I get excited just thinking about it. You know, it, it really upsets me. Not, not upset, that's a strong word. It really bothers me sometimes when I hear people say, I can't wait till God comes back. Man, I know me. That's gonna, according to the book of Amos chapter 5, the day of the Lord is the day of woe. Can you imagine us standing in front of a holy God and looking into a holy God's holy eyes? I'm scared of that day. To be honest with you, I'm scared of it. Because I know me, how sorry a person I am. And how many times I'm like Israel going, loving the world, loving God. Loving the world, loving God. And if you're honest, you're the same way. And we're going to have to stand in front of that holy God. But hey, after that, After that time, heaven, heaven, can't explain anymore, can you? Isn't that saying enough? Heaven. Man, that that word just resonates with me, heaven. It's a place of serenity and security, heaven. Man, if there's any other word... That's just, that sums it all up. That's why we should strive to never fall into a spiritual famine. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. Father, we pray for tonight. Dear Lord, I, I pray that uh, you watch over and protect us. Dear God, be with our pastor. Fill him with the Holy Spirit of God. As this is Thursday in South Korea, and he's getting, uh, getting up and getting ready. Lord, put a hedge of protection around him. I praise your name for bringing the Johnsons back safely to us today. But Father, we've got so many that are in need, so many that are hurting, so many that that don't even realize that they're in a famine. Lord, I pray that we look at ourselves for what we really are and we look to you. Thank you for your blessings upon us now. In Jesus' name, amen.